Good morning. Good to see everyone. Well, most of you back here for day two. This is what it looks like when someone is what we call buying time. So what I'm doing right now is just filling the space with my voice so that I can encourage those still getting a cup of tea to fall, fall uh, into the room. Yes, you, I'm talking about you. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. It's so brilliant to see you here uh, for day two. I'm delighted to be back on stage and we've got two panels coming your way today uh, with lots of interesting insight to add and perspectives to share. Today is going to be a much lighter day. We are hopefully running up until two o'clock, uh, but it's a jam-packed show nonetheless. Remember, the best show in town, so the DG told us. Uh, I will be discussing, hopefully, uh, just giving you a little bit of a brief about what we're expecting for the rest of today, and then I will welcome uh, the moderator for my first panel. Uh, today's discussion is focusing predominantly on youth movements and con consultants uh, having to take their place within the climate change discussion and discourse, how innovation and human mobility should and will be at the center of innovation uh, and global policy discussions need to center the youth as much as any other groups. Now the last panel, so this will be the fourth panel that we will uh, have today, will highlight the shared responsibilities of all actors and the importance of transformational partnerships, transformational partnerships with private sectors for climate action. So that's roughly the roadmap to where we're going. But before we do that, let's get you going. Nothing, nothing from this room. Uh, I would like to introduce Ayom. Ayom is a multicultural band with members from Brazil, Angola, Italy, and Greece. Ayom blends centuries-old traditions with the black and rhythmical language of Lusophony cultures, providing a hot-stepping voyage across the African diaspora. Whew, what an intro, who wrote that? Ayom, please take the stage. Se essa vida não me matar, tamborim Se essa terra não me comer, tamborim Ai, 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 tamborim Para o ano eu voltarei, tamborim Se essa vida não me matar, tamborim Se essa terra não me comer, tamborim Ai, 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 tamborim Para o ano eu voltarei, tamborim
Cada passo que eu dei Faz me lembrar de onde eu venho E a gente que eu deixei Trago em mim no peito Na saudade eu encontrei Mais a força que o lamento E um dia eu voltarei Eu prometo, eu prometo Choro que eu não chorei Quando eu deixei você A saudade que fica O tempo mandou dizer Se eu não curar Vou adormecer Oxalá Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I would like to speak in Spanish to express better, so if you want to understand. Buenos dias. Bon Good morning. Good morning to all of you. It's a great pleasure for us to share this moment with you. We are a young a multicultural project, and this song we just played is called Oshala. And we would like to express the feeling of being away from home, from our origins. We are all migrants and we are all gathering to strengthen and to live what is being far from our homeland, from our people, from our own codes. Oshala is the energy, it's like Inshala. And Oshala which is Morisha from Brazil, meaning peace and the beginning of everything. And now we'll play Seca, is a snapshot, a registry of people from a specific area in the northeast of Brazil. They don't get rain there and they don't get help because of political, there's no political will. But the world today has uh, this challenge, water and water management and the planet management who is shouting for help.
Acabou de nascer É a vida que vai conhecer Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Ay, oh, another round of applause, please. Fabulous. Well done. Nominal. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. Now, far be it from me to stop a dance party, but this is the United Nations, so please kindly go back to your seats immediately. Thank you very much. Where's the DG? I love it. You nearly got me up, but I was too busy typing what I'm saying next. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that was Iom. They are a phenomenal band. I have, in the time that they were performing, downloaded both of uh, their most recent albums, so feel free to do so. They are across all platforms. That's just a bit of a sales pitch for them. It is, however, time to turn our attention back to the agenda for today. Now, the next panel is one that rests very close to my heart. Um, my focus as a journalist is environmental journalism, uh, specifically that which affects women and children. So the panel that we have coming up uh, with Michelle uh, is going to be one that is incredibly important for us to take on board and take back to our home countries with us. The panel is The New Solutions for New Generations, Youth Perspectives on Climate Action and Mobility. Our moderator for this panel is Michelle Klein-Solomon, the IOM Regional Director for Central and North America and the Caribbean. She is based in San Jose, Costa Rica. She assumed this position on the 31st of August 2020 and she provides advice to governments in all the regions of the world and to regional intergovernmental and non-governmental entities on a wide range, a whole host of migration policy matters. 
From 2016 to 2018, she was director of Gip, uh, Gipball Compact for uh, Migration at the IOM, leading the IOM support to states and partners in the development and implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, orderly and Regular Migration. I now introduce and welcome our moderator to the stage to introduce her panel for the next 90 minutes. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wonderful to see you all. And Amy, that was great fun. Where are you, Amy? I, I might want to continue the dance party. And I brought a little bit of my new look from Central America, from the Caribbean and the, and the Pacific. I was inspired by our moderator from yesterday with her bright yellow. So I'm bright orange for the morning this morning. And I think it's a good signal for our youth and our youth engagement. It's a great pleasure to be with you all this morning. We have a really rich panel. I have five presenters, and it's going to be interactive like yesterday. And I'm going to challenge you to be interactive also. So I'm going to hear from each of them one at a time. I'm going to call them up individually and get them started, uh, introduce each one, and give them each the first question that we'll be posing. And then once they've all had a couple of rounds of questions, We'll be coming to you. And again, as the moderator said yesterday, we want you to focus on questions that you have for them. Not so much reading your national statements, but really thinking about the issues that are presented here and what kinds of questions you have that will help all of us collectively mm -hmm. take better decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, to frame today's discussion, it is extremely important to recognize that youth, young people, are actually at the highest record total number of the global population, 1.8 billion people in the world today are under the age of 30. That's extraordinary in total terms. It's also extraordinary in percentage terms. 31% of the full world's population is under the age of 30, which means we need to be hearing from, listening to, and considering the challenges that young people will be facing because they are the ones who will inherit and have to live in the world that we have created and will be the ones facing the challenges that we leave behind. And very particularly, the f youth of the future will live in a world that is profoundly affected by climate change, mm -hmm. that will live in economies that in societies that are more vulnerable, more, less resilient because of the effects of climate change in all of its many dimensions, we talked about yesterday, but will also be entering economies that are, in a sense, hampered by the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. So agriculture, fishing, aquaculture, uh, forestry, all of these areas that will be very hard to make a living, which will lead to increasing pressures for movement from rural communities to urban communities, putting increased pressure on cities, not only to provide services, but also to offer jobs, livelihoods for growing youth populations. And what will that mean in terms of the pressure for displacement? And we heard our new Director General, Amy Pope, very exciting yesterday, we want to be able to better anticipate the effects of climate change so we don't leave people in harm's way, that people have an opportunity to not simply wait and be forced to react, mm -hmm. but perhaps to take preventive, adaptive um, steps. So to actually move out of harm's way before harm hits, it's much harder after the fact. Mm -hmm. It's much easier if we plan and prepare and don't wait until people are displaced and their rights have been violated and they are tremendously vulnerable. But to see in this context, not only migration as a survival strategy, but in the best case scenario, migration as an adaptation strategy, something where migrants can actually be empowered to move in safe, regular, orderly ways to not be in harm's way. And we want to hear, enough from me, we want to hear directly from the people who are in this panel, from the people from various different regions of the world. And these people were selected very carefully because they are not simply representatives of youth from their regions. They are people who are actually taking action. 
They are actually leading movements. They are actually taking the responsibility and using the space that is offered to them to advance action on climate change and mobility. And with that, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce our panel this morning and to kick us off I'm going to invite you each one at a time to come up and I'm going to ask you a question, so be ready. I'm going to turn over to you very quickly. First, let me invite Rose. Rose Kobusinge from Migration, Environmental and Climate Change Advocate. Rose is from Uganda. And please join me up here on the stage, Rose. So nice to see you. Good morning, my dear. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. And Rose, if you don't mind, I'm going to pose the very first question for you to get us kicked off so people can hear a little bit about you but also hear your, view, your voice, your views. And the question I want to ask you is, it's clear that there are different challenges and barriers, both to youth engagement and to youth voice on policy. And I want to hear from you in your region, what have you experienced as a youth advocate in the context of climate action and human mobility? And very specifically, what's your perspective about the key challenges that you face in your region when you talk about climate change and specifically it's linked to human mobility and and again recognizing that youth are disproportionately affected by climate change and of course in the future unfortunately are more likely to be displaced or forced to migrate as a result let's turn over to rose thank you so much for joining us thank you michelle uh, hi everyone really a pleasure being here and greetings from uganda i arrived here yesterday. Uh, yeah, I think great questions. I, from Uganda, the Uganda perspective and the Eastern Horn of Africa perspective, I'm sure everyone knows what is happening there. Maybe I shouldn't assume, but in the Eastern Horn of Africa, we've had five consecutively failed rainy seasons. And mm -hmm. you can imagine what that means to the livelihoods of people, the young people. Actually, last week I was mm -hmm. in Mohokia IDP camp flood victims of 2020, they were displaced during COVID, and they are still in the camp, they have not yet been resettled. And I'm going to quote what one of the uh, mm -hmm. IDP told me. Mm -hmm. They left us here, they ignored us, they threw us here. Wow. They have had seven months without any kind of support. And that is an IDP camp. For the last four months, I've been in refugee camps in Rwanda. And I'm doing my research there on uh, renewable energy access in refugee settings. The situation is still not good, but to be honest, I'm, I feel ashamed to say it was much better than in, in an IDP. Mm. What does that mean? Mm. That climate migrants have been left behind mm. in development, in the climate agenda. Mm -hmm. And in Uganda, we, that, those are the, not the only ones we have. We have climate migrants in, in, the, in, in the east, in the east of the country and also in the Bundibudjo area. Most of them are flood victims. If you go to Kenya, the northwestern, the northwestern part of Kenya, if you go to Somalia, to Sudan, to, uh, to Rwanda and Congo, where the, was it in May, people were displaced by, by floods again. So um, I'm not going to talk about this because you know the challenges of floods and, and you know, cyclones and the droughts. But talking about youth, so Last month, we had the African Youth Forum, mm -hmm. uh, Climate Mobility Forum, organized by IOM, uh, the, East, the Eastern Horn of Africa Regional Office. And we were over 70 young people figuring out what our voice can be in the, in the expansion of the Kampala Declaration. I don't know if, it's, if I should assume that we know the Kampala mm -hmm. Declaration, but it was a declaration by ministers in the Eastern Horn of Africa to act on climate mobility and integrate climate mobility in the development plans and the migration and climate policies. So that was last year and this year it was being expanded to a continental level and we had a youth, youth consultation to see the, to ensure that the youth voices are part of the expansion of the declaration. And these are the messages that came from the young people. Young people are not just the future. They are the present. Mm. And whatever policies and programs are being developed now are being developed for the youth. And you cannot develop something for the youth without them. Exactly. So youth want to be co-designers. Youth want to be collaborators. They don't want to be just put on the panel and then nothing happens after that. We are focused on action and initiatives. When I came back from the camp, talking to people, talking about 
the kind of solutions they want to see. Most of the solutions where we want to be resettled. We've been left here. We can't live. If I had time, I would have showed you the pictures and the video that I recorded there. The, the, the settlement is horrible, the way they are sleeping. Mm -hmm. So they want to be resettled. And that is what you were talking about, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Can planned resettlement and migration plans be adaptation? Yes, they can. And we just need to harness those ones. From the young people perspective, the capacity, not only just in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of resources and funds is lacking. I left that camp feeling powerless. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can do these initiatives. I can do the livelihoods on soap making, on sustainable agriculture, but I don't have the resource capacity to do that. And uh, those are the challenges. And also coming to these spaces, I mean, to me, I feel privileged because I know joy that I met in the camp has no idea that IDM is happening. Even when I tried to share about climate change, I felt so, it was so hard because someone is telling you, oh, my neighbor just died and starved to death. And you're like, oh, climate change. No, the urgency to them is not knowing about climate change. It's first getting access to the best needs. And then we can talk about climate change after that, after getting what to eat. So I felt powerless. I was like, I can do these livelihoods. I can do sustainable farming. I can do, because uh, they have a bit of land that they can, they, they, that some organization, actually a youth organization called Dava Youth Climate Action Network, hired for like four of them mm -hmm. to plant, and then they can share as a group, share the food. I was like, we can do this, but I don't have the capacity, so I felt power, powerless. But coming here, I hope mm -hmm. I'll share with you after this, and maybe you can give me more power and see how I can share these resources, if they're there, or knowledge with other young people. And I want to go back next time with solutions, not to just go and ask these people what challenges they're facing. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you. You've said many, many interesting things. Mm -hmm. It's a great kickoff to our discussion. Uh, there's so many things I could pick up, but I want to pick just one. There is no way for solutions for youth without youth, with youth, for youth, and youth absolutely at the table helping design the solutions. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to hearing from you more. Let me call our next panelist up, and you've already met her because she was part of our opening yesterday morning. Kulud Ben Masur, she is the African Youth Ambassador for Peace of the African Union. Kulud, please join us, and thank you so much for being here again today. Good morning, my dear. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much. You'll be over on the end. And while you're walking over there, I'd like you to think about exactly the question I posed to Ruth Rose. What do you see as the biggest challenges and barriers to youth engagement on climate change and mobility in your context? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, lovely uh, in, uh, start of the discussion. Uh, I have to say that we had a discussion yesterday with my fellow youth uh, delegates and we exchanged a lot on the challenges that we perceived as young people and the barriers that are presented to us. And allow me to speak about my region, North Africa. Perhaps it will bring uh, a regional uh, perspective. I think we have a very uh, exceptional context, let me say it this way, because we do have uh, the real meaning of climate-induced mm. mobility. And we, although we have real issues of internal displacement and climate change risks and challenges, we feel that they are becoming really alerting, especially to the vulnerable com groups that are the young people. Um, now, when I see uh, how these challenges are presented and what, as young people, mm -hmm. Uh, our role is to, to provide support and perhaps to think about solutions. Um, as Rose mentioned, we feel powerless at some point because the challenges are not just to be in the spaces and to speak up, but sometimes we need real concrete actions and tangible results to overcome these cascading risks. And to me, when I see um, the recent events that happened in Libya and Morocco mm -hmm. and the challenges that we faced earlier this year in Tunisia with, in terms of drought and water scarcity. It makes me think, what can we do 
uh, as young people when we are invited to such places? How can we collectively collaborate together and come up with the help of international bodies like the IOM and so many other agencies to overcome these challenges and perhaps raise awareness more about how to combat them? Um, there is one thing that I always try to reflect whenever I'm invited to such spaces. That is the um, psychological effects mm -hmm. of this climate change effects on young people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we tend to focus more on the resilience and mm -hmm. the uh, adaptation mechanisms, the medication, mitigation mechanisms, but we tend to forget the real psychological impacts on young people. Yes. The trauma, the social anxiety. It's not easy to take a young person from a safe and stable environment and force them because sometimes it's an obligation it's not an option to leave a stable environment and go perceive uh, a much stable I would say uh, perhaps a refugee camp or somewhere else to start from scratch so those psychological effects are really a barrier to the hopes and the dreams that we mentioned yesterday in the opening statements, because we, that's what we're trying to promote. We're trying to create a much more resilient environment so that whenever a climate change effect can happen, at least the consequences are not um, blocking to the advancement of young people. So I think it's really important that we do not neglect such aspect when we speak about climate change in the context of human mobility. Bravo. I, I thank you so much for, for, first of all, all that you're doing to bring visibility to climate change and mobility in your region, but very specifically for bringing out the psychological impact on youth in particular. Youth, by definition, are still growing. They're still finding a way in the world, and this becomes part of your psychological makeup if the challenges that face, and you're right, too many people are actually forced, not with a question of choice, to move. And the displacement has profound, lasting psychological effects. And I appreciate you uh, bringing this up so front and center. We need to be worried about the and concerned about psychological development and the long-term implications. Thank you, Kulu. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Let me invite our next panelist up. I'd like to invite Eddie Frank Vasquez Sanchez. And Eddie, if you wouldn't mind, oh, wonderful to see you. Thank you. He, Eddie is one of the young leaders for the Sustainable Development Goals. And maybe, Eddie, you can think about as you come up to the stage, telling us just for a sentence, good morning, mucho gusto, bienvenido. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're coming from, and the voice that you represent, as well as, as the other two panelists have just said, some of the barriers and the challenges that you and your colleagues face. Thank you very much, Eddie. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, first of all, good morning to everyone. It's really nice to be here, also representing the voices of the youth in the Caribbean. Um, my name is Eddie. I'm from the Dominican Republic. I'm one of the 17 youth leaders for the Sustainable Development Goals, recognized by the UN Youth Envoy Office in the UN. So um, talking about challenges, sometimes it's difficult to talk about it because the main challenge is the real challenge. In this case, climate inaction. Mm -hmm. For us in the oh. Caribbean islands, we face a reality that we can't avoid. Mm -hmm. Each year after year, we receive natural disaster, which are intensifying each time that we do not take the necessary action under climate change. But that reality, we can't avoid it. For many families in the Caribbean, climate change means that we need to be displaced, forcibly displaced from, for the environments that we live in, for the realities that we have been living for the last years. That's not something we can negotiate. That, that's not something that somebody will tell us, okay, you can live with that. Yes, we have to. It's the only thing that we have left because it's the reality that we have been condemned, unfortunately, to live. But that's a reality that it's not only for this year. We face it year after year during more than th six months that the usual time that uh, um, the hurricane season lasts in the Caribbean. So talking about challengers, most, most specifically last year in the Dominican Republic, the organization that I belong to, Juventud Sostenible, we made a nationwide consultation about climate change and youth in the Dominican Republic. And uh, trying to identify different topics, we realized that Dominican youth were concerned about three main perspectives when we talk about climate mobility. The first one is the emotional coping um, that was already mentioned by Kulut. Um, the second one is the limited opportunities that are linked to moving to another place. Mm -hmm. 
And the third one is also um, regarding to the absence of guarantee to our human rights, but also to the access to the public and basic services for us as, as young people. So our development phase uh, itself with all these limitations, which, are, um, which our previous generation have faced when they decided, I come from a family that decided to move um, to the capital city in order to get better opportunities. But that was a decision they took. Mm -hmm. It was a decision that um, it was hard for them, I, I recognize it, but it, they weren't necessarily um, forcefully being displaced to one place to another just because there was a major situation happening around them. And that's something that really concerns us. That's something that put our future at risk. And that's something that um, needs to be a little bit more considered when we talk about policy engagement and development in this kind of dialogues. Thank you so much, Eddie. Yes, I, as you know, part of my remit includes the Caribbean and uh, Central America, and I travel all the time to see, and you're right, it's an existential issue, in this, particularly in the small island states, but not exclusively, and the Dominican Republic, Haiti on the other side of the island, and the, com and the countries around are very profoundly affected by the hurricane season, and by the rising sea levels also, which are making it harder and harder for people to live safe and dignified lives at home. Uh, your family is a good example of people making the choice to move before they're forced to and adapting that way. Unfortunately, others in other Caribbean islands have not had that, that privilege. And we saw in the video that uh, we showed yesterday, colleagues and uh, friends and, and, and member states uh, in, in other island countries like Dominica were displaced completely as a result of hurricanes in the last few years, and it leads to long-term destruction and displacement, not, not something that we would want to wish on anybody. Thank you for being here, Eddie, and thank you for sharing thank your you. perspectives. Let me invite now Himavati Shekhar. Himavati has just arrived this morning from a very long journey. Thank you so much for making the long travel to be with us. She is actually the founder of an organization. Lovely to see you. Thank you. To called Enabling Necessary Action Through Climate Talk, and is she is the global south focal point for Yongo. And maybe you could tell us briefly what that means and a little bit about the challenges and the obstacles that you face in your region in terms of bringing the voice of youth to bring action. As Eddie said, absolutely, the issue is lack of action. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel very privileged to be here and like Rose mentioned, I think even coming here was a matter of choice and I've had the privilege to be able to just take a flight, get my visa and come here. And that is not a choice everybody has. Mm -hmm. So um, I, um, but back in India, I'd, I've been working, I start, I'm a lawyer by training. So, you know, when as, uh, as law students, we always like look at what is wrong with the society and try to come up with solutions using law or policies um, itself. And when I started off, I worked with an NGO and uh, we used to represent these vulnerable communities. You know, people, governments take decisions and people are forced to move. Climate changes, people are forced to move. Um, but many a times we don't uh, always recognize the human rights impacts mm -hmm. of, uh, what this, you know, forced displacement actually means. And, um, and so many a times we also look at like, okay, let's rehabilitate them and what next? Because um, I think just back in April, I was working um, in the south of India and uh, because of a cyclone, the community was set up in a school as a rehabilitation center. Seven years later, they still stay there. No, no. That's been their house. But this also means that children who were supposed to go to that school are not studying anymore, right? So it, it's also about kind of actions that we tend to take. You know, it's one thing that there is inaction, but then are we taking the right kind of action mm. to support the people who are migrating? Mm. And, you know, thinking beyond the, you know, normal thinking. So one uh, article I read, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Sundarbans, um, mm -hmm. right? 
So it spoke about how women are forced into prostitution because of migration. It's simple, you know, climate change, there's so many floods, people move, especially to urban cities for like, again, better opportunities, but also because they're forced. Now, um, as young people, many, you know, in India, people marry young, you know, people at the age of 25, they're married, they have kids. Men tend to be skilled, you know, they can go to an urban area, get a job in a factory. But then if it's like a single lady or a woman who wants to contribute because standards of living in a city is very difficult, very high. So women end up becoming prostitutes to support their own family. And this is not something we want out of, you know, anybody migrating as a consequence of migration itself. So in terms of how we perceive migration, especially for young people, because when we look out for opportunities, we still have a lot of barriers on, you know, getting those opportunities or act, make, you know, having access to them itself. But it is also about how do we ensure that we are not contributing to mm. any problem that is already existing, right? Because we have, as much as we are victims, we should also not become perpetrators. So there's always a barrier in terms of the kind of actions we take. And that is where we bring in, like, you know, the concept of we speak about intergenerational equity. Are we giving the same planet to our future generations? We are young people, right? We, maybe the previous generations did not make a conscious choice, but because we are also victims, we are making that conscious choice of ensuring that the planet is better for our future, you know, children and future generations. So there's so many difficulties that come with that. We cannot do things the way it was done. So migration, as much as we go out and look out for opportunities, I think there's significantly huge barriers and young people can come up with solutions. And again, as mentioning, we must be co-designers in the solutions, but I think we also need the support to ensure and mm -hmm. the fact that we are empowered to be able to make the choices that we can make and make better choices for the planet itself. Excellent. Thank you very much, Himavati. Thank you very much. We're going to focus on your last bit in the next round of questions, and I want to pick up from there in just a moment. But I do want to point out something that you said that echoed something Eddie said about the rights and the human rights aspects here. We need to put the human rights of individuals at the center of this discourse and the specific vulnerability to rights violations and to lack of respect and fulfillment of the rights of young people. And it's not just during the displacement or migration process, but afterwards. Mm -hmm. And what you said about the schoolhouse still being used seven years later as a shelter for people, displacing the students who are supposed to be learning there, we need to look at the impact of those actions and think about the rights and the various rights that are not being respected and fulfilled. I like your, your point that we need to make sure that our actions don't further aggravate or violate rights as we act. Thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you very soon. But let me invite our fifth and final panelist up to speak, Dalia, Dalia Fernanda Marquez Añez. And she is the founder, hola querida, como estas? Yeah. <laughs> founder of Juventud Unida en Acción. And let me pose the same question to you about the challenges and barriers you face, and maybe tell the others a little bit about yourself and what you're working on as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So first of all, I want to thank to the coordination of this international dialogue for giving me the opportunity to be here raising the voices of the young people from Latin America and from my country. I have to say that young people in Latin America is facing the consequences of climate change daily. We are suffering floods, loss of biodiversity that is really, really but in Latin America, because we have six mega diverse countries there, and also extreme drugs that at the same time affect 
the production systems for food and food security that affects our economies, livelihoods, and force young people to move between the borders of their countries, but at the same time outside the borders of the countries. In that sense, the organization that I am representing here, Juventud Unida en Acción, or Youth United in Action, have been working on research with youth migrants mm -hmm. in LAC. Uh, we have been focused especially in Colombia, Venezuela, some countries in Central America. Uh, we asked them what are the, the challenges they face in the migration processes. So first of all, uh, they face the insecurity, typical insecurity of our region. Uh, at the same time, uh, something that the young people from Venezuela raise is the increase of requirements to have mobility with the, between countries. Mm -hmm. Now they are facing more requirements to move out Venezuela to other countries in the region, and that forced them to ask to irregular groups to facilitate them uh, and to support them to move from Venezuela to other countries, mostly of time taking uh, risk, putting their life on risk, uh, being vulnerable in front of those irregular groups. And I want to raise one example is the Darien jungle. Mm -hmm. By now this year, more than 200,000 people have been going through that jungle. 350,000, more than 350,000. Right now, it's sadly. Already it's, this year. That's terrible. Which is much more than last year, which was a record year. Exactly. And 21% of those are children and youth people. So that is something that we need really, really have to, to take into consideration. Also, the lack of information, the lack of support for for this process young people just is forced to leave their home and they go to the first place that came to their minds without any any kind of information about the country where they are going to any kind of support about what they are going to do how to get access to health services education job etc they also have to face the xenophobia. We need to try to work on that because even in Latin America, we have xenophobia, a lot of xenophobia there. And I want to put the focus on the lack of psychosocial support. Mm -hmm. uh, in Latin America, less than 100% of the budget is invested in mental health support. And young people, young migrants, the, the consequences of climate change have to deal with the trauma of the disaster that they live in their home and the, tra the trauma of leaving their homes and being totally alone in these new countries. And they don't have any kind of support. But young people is working to try to approach this. I have really good examples that I want to share with you during this panel. And also, the other challenge we face is the human traffic. Thank you, Dahlia. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, your presentation really resonates with me because I sit on the other side of the Darien Gap and all of the people who come through. And it is shocking to see how many young people are part of these extraordinarily vulnerable flows. And of course, the transit is through a, uh, an ecological preserve. The Darien Gap is a jungle. It is not a migration route. It is a jungle and it needs to be preserved. Uh, but when people are crossing it, they are tremendously vulnerable, not only to the natural elements, but of course, your last point about the, the engagement of human smugglers and traffickers taking advantage of the tremendous desperation mm -hmm. of people who go. And what you said before others, people don't leave in a, in a highly irregular manner unless they feel they have no other choice, mm -hmm. unless they feel that's their best opportunity to survive. And that is precisely what we're seeing through the Darien Gap right now, which is just tremendous misery because people feel they have no other opportunity. And that is tremendously upsetting and heartbreaking. And more than 21%, as you mm -hmm. said, are children and youth. Um, 
You echoed very well what Kulud said about the trauma and lack of psychosocial or mental health support, both for having left your own country, but also the challenges of integration in a new country. And you're right to focus on both sets of challenges as very real for well-being. So now we're going to turn to solutions. And Hima, Himavati, you started us on that. And if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. And I'm going to actually, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to those who wrote the script for this. I've already violated one of the rules that I was instructed to. I'm about to willingly violate the second one right now. I'm going to ask you a double question. OK, you ready? And I'm going to ask the same question to each of you, because I think they're very related, and it'll help focus your responses. So we're turning now mm -hmm. to your ideas for solutions and specific actions that can be taken by each of you and others like you around the world. And what I want to ask you, specific, and each of you think about it, but Himavati, I'm going to start with you, so heads up. And, and then I'll be jumping around the rest of the panel, so you won't know what order I'm coming to you. And I'll, I'll decide after she speaks. So specifically, what strategies or policies do you believe can effectively address the impact of climate change on mobility while specifically supporting your aspirations as youth leaders and facilitating youth access to basic services, including psychological and mental health services, which I think need to be understood as a fundamental right. And in that, how can you as youth leaders and others around the world play an influential role in shaping and implementing climate migration related strategies? And I want you to get specific on that. I want to hear from each of you at least one concrete action, one concrete solution. And in that, I'd like you to think about climate change, climate action, innovation, and human mobility collectively in thinking about your solutions. I think part of the reason we're all so excited to hear from you is that you're full of new ideas. You're not constrained by the way things were done in the past. You're willing to break out of the silos, break out of the expected ways to propose innovative solutions. So Himavati, let me turn to you to hear from you. How do you think youth specifically, and you in particular, what can you do to take um, action while supporting on climate mobility in the context of, of um, climate mobility, excuse me. And, and wh what do you need from the rest of us to be more empowered? Thank you. Um, as much as many a times we always speak about youth empowerment, particularly for policies, I'm a huge believer of good policies because you know one good policy can benefit millions of people. Um, but what we need to start with as much as we start with young people, is building the capacity of the policy makers. Okay. Uh -huh. Because mm -hmm. many a times we have policy makers yeah. making <laughs> policies without understanding the issues itself. Zero knowledge, zero understanding of the consequences of the policies that they're making. And we need to help them understand or build their capacity to be able to connect you know, why are people moving because of climate change? Uh, do they really understand that? Is it because they don't feel safe? Is it because of their livelihood? Is it because, you know, they don't have access to food or water? People don't know this cause. They only understand the symptoms. They don't know the cause. Mm. So when policymakers start understanding the cause of why people are moving, their solutions start being better. So for me, as much as you encourage and empower young people, please empower policymakers to make better policies. Excellent, please. So all of you in the room, policymakers, we're gonna be coming to you very soon. So that's a heads up and a direct challenge from Himavati and, and a call for your actions. So be ready. We're gonna to turn to you in just a few minutes. Thank you very much for that. Rose, may I turn to you now and ask you the same thing? What would you recommend in terms of actual concrete action that youth can take and what do you need in order to be able to do so? Uh, I think I would say every region needs a kind of complete declaration on migration environments and climate change. Mm -hmm. And speaking about that and policies from 
my perspective, we have like very beautiful policies most mm -hmm. times, but they stop at that stage, beautiful papers, and mm -hmm. that is it. And I think if every region has a declaration on migration, environment, and climate change, focusing on protecting climate migrants, focusing on, uh, you know, harnessing migration and planned resettlement as an adaptation option, but then it should go, people should not put policies in place without action plans and without resources to actually implement and without capacity, as you're talking about, to implement those policies. And uh, with that, of course, I can't forget the action plan has to put youth at the center, like a youth committee to yeah. hold the leaders accountable, but also do their part in implementing, as you said, uh, implementing the youth perspectives, the youth uh, commitments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, Hema said something like, it's very similar with what is happening in the IDP I was in. People went and started sleeping in a school, and then they were displaced again by floods in the camp where they were. No. They were displaced again by floods. And they stayed there. And the rainy season has started. They're worried they may be displaced again. Mm -hmm. And they can't go back where they, they were because they don't know what will happen. They make, and the memories are very bad. It's not just displacement. Their family members, loved ones died there, so they can't go back there. And that connects to the uh, psychosocial support. So... Um, in, oh, resources, I can't talk about resources yes. enough. Like having policies and programs, but without resources, it will just leave us in beautiful rooms like this and with no actual action. So let's mobilize resources, let's lobby for resources. Mm -hmm. And I think if a certain country started implementing an actionable, practical, actionable program, I think the rest will learn from them. Great. Thank you, Rose. Thank you very much. I think your call, not just to action, but for resources to implement um, whatever is agreed. I love your statement about the Kampala Declaration. I'd love to see a Kampala Declaration on climate change and mobility everywhere in the world, but exactly as you say, a real emphasis on implementation and making it real. Thank you very much. Kaluda, I'm going to come to you now and specifically ask you about strategies, policies, and resources, as Rose just said, that can effectively address the impact of climate change on human mobility and specifically um, meeting the aspirations of youth and ensuring your, your well-being. Um, when I first hear, heard the question, that, uh, when you said it the first time and you said the word aspirations, I was like, wow, that's a big word for me to try to transfer the aspirations as a young person. But I'll try to give you two uh, perhaps strategies that I think they are relevant and they can actually uh, capsulate the vision of young people and how we want more climate uh, action in the context of human mobility. I think, especially in the North African region, what I see um, that is, there is a huge gap in terms of data and information. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever I read a report or an article, especially about climate change and human mobility, there is also this tendency of giving just general information. And recently, I joined a panel in a, conf in a forum about women in climate, and we highlighted how even in Tunisia, in one specific country, mm -hmm. the disparities and the differences from one state to another are huge. So the person migrating from the north for specific reasons is not the same, does not have the same purposes as a person migrating from the south. Even the climate conditions are not the same. The climate uh, effects that, are, that they are faced with are not the same. So we cannot provide um, data that is general and expect that we will have efficient results out of it. I think it's about time that we, we start giving micro and uh, macro uh, information. This data will allow us as young people to understand the necessities of each region. Mm -hmm. Because in one region like North Africa or East Africa or any region uh, in Africa, they have similarities, but yet they have huge differences. So I think it's really important that we highlight these uh, these challenges in each region. So we have to be specific so that we understand the reasons behind human mobility for a young person migrating from the north or from the south. And that will allow us also to understand what are the challenges that our regions are faced with. Because if I understand what's going on in my region through these 
data research or 3D policy papers, I can understand how I can contribute to these challenges. And it, it will allow me also to understand why other people are migrating and perhaps create this um, maybe um, I would feel perhaps empathetic more towards the needs of other people so that when I speak up about them, I understand what they are going through. Even though, as Rose uh, mentioned earlier, we cannot be in their shoes, but we try to reflect as much experience as, as we can. The second um, solution, I know this might be too ideal to think about right now, but I think it's really time to include climate education. And we cannot raise generations that they don't know what's going on in the world. I think we need to create this culture of having the climate action in mind since an early stage, so that when a person grows up, they understand what's the meaning of floods, what the, what's the meaning of droughts, what the country is facing in terms of climate action, and raise this culture of contributing to the environment and to the climate, so that even when they are confronted with climate action events, they know that they had the idea before and they are prepared for it and we do not fall into the psychological traumas that we mentioned earlier. Excellent. Thank you so much for highlighting the data <coughs> needs, very specific data needs and recognizing the diversity of experiences in different regions of the world and therefore the implications of that. Thank you very much, Kulud, and, and emphasizing the need for capacity building and education uh, of the next generation to be well aware of what's coming. Eddie, I'm going to turn to you now, if you don't mind. And if you could focus on strategies, policies that you think can effectively um, address the impact of climate change on human mobility while specifically meeting the aspirations of youth. Any concrete actions you would like to propose? Yeah, um, this is the, the question that usually gets me a little bit more of excitement. <laughs> I look a lot with policy and government institutions. So um, on the first side, I will say that our three main um, phases that I will integrate into policy development for integrating youth perspective into climate mobility. The first is um, related to um, engagement, youth people engagement. Second is um, youth people support. And th third is um, improvement of the taken actions. So let's start first one with engagement. Mm -hmm. I would like to acknowledge how important it is to be present here in this, not only in this panel, but only for the different representatives that are hearing the stories and the perspective that we are bringing into the conversation. That's a really fruitful um, exchange that we hope that could be taken into consideration for whatever actions you're gonna take after leaving this space. But also um, these kind of exchanges are necessary, not only where we are having the conversation, what, but what happened after it, exactly. as Rose mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So that's where youth people support is necessary. We're talking about um, political support, we're talking about um, financial support, we're talking about technical support as well. We need that support in order to take the ideas from the conversations to the real action. And the third one related to the improvement is related to, okay, we did something, how we can escalate it, how we can do it better, how we can integrate more perspective, more um, um, different um, populations or histories of people that are being left behind. So once we do those three things into policy development, we're going to have a pretty interesting exchange of um, generations as well. And taking that into consideration, I think that research and innovation played a crucial role in this perspective. Um, First, as, as it was mentioned before, the, the data needs that we have right now, we, have, we know about climate mobility, but how much do we know about youth into climate mobility affected by climate change specifically? We have a uh, information gap right now that we need to fill, and that gap would only be filled when we integrate the different generations into that conversation. And innovation play a crucial role, I mentioned, because um, there's a lot of things that we can do Migration by itself has shown us how culture development, but also national development is possible. We're not talking about, we know that sometimes it becomes difficult for countries from the political perspective, well, but we have an opportunity in front of us. An opportunity that right now, if we take the right decisions, we will have excellent results when we are trying to include, but also ensure and guarantee that youth people that is being displaced due to climate issues 
are, are effectively integrated into the society and the economy. Thank you very much. I think the key word from all the good things that you just said is about the engagement and making sure the engagement is meaningful and that you have the capacity to engage effectively and that your views are actually taken into consideration in the policies that follow. Which leads me perfectly to our audience. And now all of you, you've heard a lot from our panelists and it's time to engage you. And to get you kicked off, we're gonna do a Mentimeter. Anybody know what a Mentimeter is? And then we'll call on d individual delegations. Uh, my, my colleague, the moderator over here, will take the list of people who want to speak. But first, we're going to do an online poll. You ready, everybody? I'm going to ask a question. And I would like each of you, colleagues, Neha, how do we get them to actually show it? Will it pop up on the screen? Yes. OK. You'll see it on the screen. So here's your challenge, everybody. And this is for each of you in your seats to please download this barcode onto your phones. We want to hear from each of you in this room. And all I'm asking you for is one word per person, one word. And we want to see what those words look like. And the specific question that I want to ask you is, can you please each and every one of you dis define in just one word what you see as the role of youth in placing climate change and human mobility at the center of global policy discussions. What is the one word for the role of youth? Please put your answers here and we're going to develop a cloud. Look at this. Keep going. I'm going to give you another minute. I want to see more. Look at this. Wow. Look at that. Keep going. I'm seeing some really big, big, powerful words popping up in the center here. I'm seeing power, action, essential, central, inspiration, voice, leadership, necessary, hope, visionary. Look at that activism, leading. These are all very powerful and strong action words about the role of youth. I think a round of applause for our panelists who are bringing us the energy, the promise, the potential of the future. You have a lot to say. You've inspired all of that up on the screen. I hope you can all see it. You are the future, you are the now. Rose, it's not just the future, it's the now. You are essential, you're powerful, you're crucial, your voices matter, you can make a difference. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. We're not done, because <laughs> now we're turning to the floor and I'm gonna turn back to our overall moderator to take some questions. Now remember folks, what we're asking you for is questions to the panelists, please, not read your prepared statements. Obviously, we care about your views. We care about the views of your country, your organization. But right now, we want this to be interactive. Over to you. I'm going to contradict you immediately. Go ahead. Feel free. <laughs> I'm feeling rebellious. I'm feeling rebellious. I think I saw... <laughs> Yeah, I might have made that up. So absolutely, your questions are encouraged. In fact, what would be best is, uh, we don't want you to get in trouble. You know, you've got to make your statements. We've got to hear you. So should we listen to perhaps the statements and then a question? Does sure. that feel useful feel free. to us? Feel free. Are you guys all right with that? Are you folks okay with it? Perfect. So uh, without any further ado, I think let's start things off uh, with Venezuela. Venezuela, if you can just hold up your little card so we know where you are in the room and then you can make your statement and ask your question, Venezuela, please. Thank you very much to the moderator and to the panelists. My country, of course, would like to greet you all, also to all the delegations that participate in this panel. We've been very attentive to the information given by the panelists. In previous sessions, we highlighted the value of young people in climate issues 
thinking that they are active actors, important for our society with big and interesting ideas that can contribute very importantly to face climate change. We observe, uh, we have a concern because of all the situation they are living and all the call of action from our young panelists about several aspects, especially trauma associated to displacement and psychosocial effect. It's clear that this effect is there. It's a direct effect and sometimes it's not well known. And this is one of the reasons our country is promoting the right to people to stay in their country of origin. And in terms of our specific um, situation, forced um, action sometimes had a very important consequence in young people. We also agree that taking care of the future of our young people is also to reject some of the economy decisions that are taken that degradate our biosystems, bioecosystems, and it's not good for population that live in those places. So we urge delegations to assume an engagement in front of that reality because young people are those that will that take the decision to migrate temporarily or permanently, and we must and we should create the needed situation with the means and sustainable policies that has been highlighted from the panelists. My country, in order to empower young Venezuelans and people from abroad, provide technical capacitation for their future and also for national development wherever they are in the world. This recently, Venezuela launched a new project for professional schools in order to grant access to education and also bearing in mind the SDGs. Our, in our country, young people are trained in environmental issues and also ecology. We have specific groups in forest. They are very important for preventing and for climate action. We also promote activities in order to increase the awareness of the correct use of natural resources and the importance of green zones and natural zones for an balanced ecologically way of living. Finally, I would like to close my intervention by saying the negative impact of some economic non-sustainable practices, which are not good for the ecology and that force displa displacement of people. My country works to follow all the agreements in the framework of UN against climate change, strengthening the state capacities and also at the regional level. Thank you very much to the moderator for understanding and also for um, being ready to hear our statements. So over to you and your panel. So, so the, this, the part that I thought was really interesting in there is, can we grow forever? Can the economy grow forever and at what ecological cost? That's what I heard from there. But moderator, over to you. Would you like me to take that to them right now or hear from anybody else? No, first? please go ahead. Okay. What do you think? What do you think? Can the economy grow forever? And obviously the delegate from Venezuela was very touched by what you said about the psychological impact. And she talked about generational trauma, which yeah. I think reflects very well what you said, Dahlia. What do you think? What do you think about what she just said? Yeah, well, is, uh, I highlight hablar en español, si yeah. <laughs> it's okay. You can I, speak Spanish if you want. It's okay. And also the concern that the young people from Venezuela expressed in the consultation we made about the increase of different requirements to have the liberty to move from Venezuela to several countries. Uh, for for me, that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We are Latin American people that also face several barriers to move to the global north. Mm -hmm. So it's unbelievable how now we are creating barriers in the global south also mm -hmm. to 
to force the young people that are leaving their homes, not because they want, it is because they are forced, because the disaster, the climate change, different situations and challenges that they are facing in their communities. So this seems like a lack of empathy mm -hmm. the, with the most vulnerable people. They are trying to find a better place to the full development. And also, I want to call all the policymakers here to take migration as an advantage and not as a problem. There are thousands of young people prepared solutions with a lot of knowledge, experiences, that wants to improve their knowledge, share their experiences, and goes to other countries to support and to be helpful for the, for the increase and, and the development of their economies. But seems like we are leaving them behind and forcing them to stay surviving facing different challenges. So please think about migration as an advantage, something good. You can take all those amazing young people and give them the opportunity to go to your countries to work, to, to study, to do something good. They have the experience of being victims of disaster. And for sure, they have amazing solutions. And also those experiences can be helpful to prevent the same situation in your countries. Thank you. Uh, I want to pick up on a, a couple of things that you said, as well as that the representative of the government of Venezuela said. I think we can all agree that we would like to see a situation where countries are resilient and people can live safe and dignified lives at home and not feel mm. they need to move in order to have their rights protected. But we also recognize that there are situations in which people feel that their opportunities will be better elsewhere. And we want to empower that ability to move in a safe, legal, and regular way and to be welcomed in another country where they can make an enormous contribution mm -hmm. to that country's development as well as back to their individual families and home countries. Thank you very much. Rose, please jump in. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So. Reflecting on what the delegates mentioned made me also remember that like over 80% of the migra migration that happened, for example, in Africa is within the country's borders and uh, the neighboring countries. Uh, looking at the dynamics between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, we have so many issues happening there. We have uh, thousands of Sub-Saharan African migrants drowning in the Mediterranean, dying there. And there's also kind of like of a trend, I don't know how to, to say this, but there's kind of a trend of a fight against some specific groups of migrants. Whereas some migrants receive the honor to be welcomed, legal routes are open for them, some mm. are not. Mm. I'm studying in the UK and there's a big program on the small boats. It's not that I, I encourage small boats, but there is no one who would risk their life to go on a small boat if they didn't have to. So who determines who deserves to be welcomed and supported, and then the rest are left to die on the sea? It's something for the policymakers to think about. Some, uh, I think you mentioned about access to information. Many young people do not know, do not have access to know which one are the safe routes and how can they get there regularly. Mm -hmm. That information is still lacking. Yes. Yeah. And uh, well, is it? Is it? Is it? I'm, I'm just thinking. What is the role of the developed countries with their historic responsibility to the greenhouse gas emissions? What role do they play in protecting climate migrants, rather than leaving them to die on the seas and trying to cross the deserts? But also within, for example, Africa. Actually, most of the migrants that die, die within Africa, trying to cross the deserts because they don't have access to legal routes, to safer routes. Mm. They don't know the options, so they end up starving along the roads and, 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 and I mean in the deserts. So there's so much need for collaboration, mm. 
intergovernmental collaboration within our own regions, but also across uh, the international borders. And uh, yeah, and then can countries grow forever? <laughs> That's a very big debate. Like, fr from, from a Ugandan perspective, I don't think we are, that is a very big concern for us at the moment because we still have a very long way to go. I will, I'll get to, if it's all right with you, moderator, I've, the list is growing exponentially. Okay, go ahead. Oh, Hima, we'll come back to you next, um, but please go ahead. Take... We move next to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Where are you? Right there. The... Right here. Please uh, make your statement and ask your question. Actually, I don't have any question. Yesterday in the morning session, I asked for a floor, but I don't know what happened. But today, from the beginning of the session, I raised and asked for the floor. I and you have it now. I'm, I'm I really I want to hear what you have to say. I appreciate it. And uh, actually, I was looking for a better and for more professional. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on the base of the 50 years of the experiences on migration and asylum seeker in Islamic Republic of Iran, it's actually started from the 1972 that Iraqi courts arriving in Iran because of the difficulties with Iraqi uh, territory. Um, uh, therefore, on that basis, I wanted to share and echo some words with you uh, about what happening in my country as a uh, neighboring uh, country of Afghanistan. Actually, on that base, younger ones in the family looking for move. Therefore, uh, what we can say about, uh, are we ready for that? Uh, 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 the, actually, I'm benefiting from the, uh, the, the panelists. It's good to talk about finding a words for the younger generations that wants to be involved. But let me explaining about the situation that happening in my country. Right now we have around five, uh, around 7,000, 50,000 students registered in the schools, in the government schools of Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, and it include the refugees and non-documented ones, everybody free of charge. More on that, around uh, 58,000 university students registered, easily 10% of the population of the Switzerland, the country that we have uh, in it right now, is in registrating in Iranian schools. In this situation, the local community of uh, my country suffering with the short resources and in infrastructures, which is weakening because of the, uh, because of the mass influx. Yeah, and it's amazing that uh, we receiving only one to two percent of the whole costs um, of the um, uh, refugees and the, the, the other ones, uh, Afghan citizens, and also we have the minor um, refugees from the, uh, Iraq also still remaining in the territory. Uh, it's in the situation that we are suffering because of the un unilateral coercive measures and sanction that imposed to us. And uh, we actually looking for the further assistance of the international community mm -hmm. in this regards. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. Moving on to Gambia. Gambia is over there. Please turn on your mic. Do you have a question for us or just a statement? I have a question as well. Please. So should I go with the question first? And, um... If you would like to, for us to get through the room quicker, I would encourage you just to ask a question. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, well, thank you, uh, the panelists, for your um, presentations. My question goes to Rose from Uganda. Um, uh, we had you loud and clear policies to be in place, programs, and to mobilize resources. Uh, what strategy is in place between the government of Uganda and youths in addressing climate change and migration matters, which you think can be shared with other states? Thank you. Can we go to Rose now for addressing the question of the Delegate of Gambia? Okay, uh, thank you so much for the question. And uh, as much as I know, we don't have a youth strategy yet, but uh, the government of Uganda is quite very good, I should say, proudly say, when it comes to migration issues and welcoming refugees, I think we're quite advanced and so many countries need to learn from, from Uganda. I can proudly say that because we have a, 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 an open refugee policy and when it comes to hospitality and people welcoming, we are a poor country in terms of GDP, but we're very rich in terms of resources which are untapped. Uh, also rich in terms of our culture in welcoming people. But on climate change, that is why I was kind of lamenting regarding implementation bit. We have the policies, but the implementation, there's a very big gap. And when we talk to the governments, they say we don't have the resources. And there's just so many challenges from trying to eradicate poverty on health and infrastructure and then climate. To be honest, sometimes, like even when a country like Uganda, most of us are at the front line of the climate crisis, sometimes when you look at the priorities, the priorities are different. So there's that big gap. And I've personally been requesting and trying to ask our leaders for that youth policy. We have the climate, we have the law, but we don't have the strategy for youth engagement. And Thank you for reminding me to continue reminding them about that. And one action that we've been also advocating for is a youth coalition, like a youth, uh, a youth forum that brings together young Ugandans on working on climate change and youth organizations and, and environment together into a uh, national level coalition. So I think that is something also that other countries can pick on. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Maybe before you go to the next one, I just want to thank the representative of the government of Iran for his statement and contribution. I'm not sure if he's still with us. But he isn't, I... but I'll, I'll pass it on when thank I can. Thank you very much. We move next to Mexico. Thank you. Uh, we are, uh, I will speak in Spanish. Uh, muchas gracias, Michelle. Gracias a los panelistas. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks to the panelists. It was very inspiring. Based in your um, ideas and your testimonies, I, I feel forced to go back to the main question, how to have more success in order to see the, 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 the motivation to leave a country, it can be violence, climate change. However, it's clear that when there's no other alternative, when there's no other option, unless moving as states, we are there to help so that these movements are safe, orderly, and regular. And I would like to talk about channels for regular um, migration. My question is, based in your experience, your needs and aspirations, to use the word that Michelle was using, which would be for you the channels for a regular migration that would give you access to this kind of opportunities you are looking for if you are in the situation that you have to leave your country and you have to move? Thank you very much. That's a very pertinent question. And I would like to suggest this. If you don't, well, we were about to come to you before, and I think the delegate of Mexico said very well, obviously, we need to look at the causes, what's compelling, um, the effects of climate change, then compelling people to move. But he rightfully said that once people feel that they need to move, how can we ensure that that takes place through safe, regular, and orderly mechanisms? What are the legal channels that you want to see available to make sure? And that's the best way to preserve people's dignity. But Himavati, I know you were going to respond before, so let me turn to you first very quickly. Okay, maybe I'll just quickly respond to this and uh, also from experience. Many a times um, people have a choice to do something legally and illegally, right? And um, it's also a matter of convenience or what is easier for me. Mm -hmm. Now, 
if the legal process, it's about having policies that are inclusive for everybody to be benefited out of that policy. So when you have a policy that addresses migration, but that is non-inclusive or not actually, I'm a victim, I'm say, um, this is something a lot of people in India sometimes face, documentation, right? Mm -hmm. I cannot benefit from the policy if I don't have the documents. Now, is the policy inclusive enough to consider, recognize me as a victim and provide me the benefits out of, for why the policy was made? Now, if, if it's gonna be a you know, tedious process, a very difficult for, process, and I have to continually prove to somebody that I'm a victim to be benefiting from that policy, I'm not gonna go through that. So it's a matter of choice when you know, people choose whether to do something legally or illegally. So it's important for policymakers to understand how to make those policies very, very inclusive. Um, so, and I just wanted to mention one thing about, you know, can economies grow forever? Uh, but it's, it's, sim it's a matter of perspective on what we consider mm. economic growth, mm. right? Uh, we have grown to understand and value trees um, more than, you know, considering them separate from our ecosystem mm -hmm. itself. Do we consider, you know, for everybody, like you close your eyes, imagine cities. Most of you will imagine skyscrapers, <laughs> not trees, right? So uh, it's, it's really about perspective when we consider growth, and I hope we can consider reforestation, afforestation as economic growth as much as building infrastructure. Completely agree about sustainable growth. Thank you very much. Back to our moderator. We move now to New Zealand. Our colleagues in New Zealand uh, have an intervention. Thank you so much to all the panelists today um, for this a constructive and, and inspiring conversation. It gives us a lot to think about. Um, for Aotearoa New Zealand, we, we observe the impacts of, of climate mobility right through our region, and we are highly conscious that the youth of today and tomorrow will be the ones who bear these impacts. So I wanted to ask a further question about data, because at the moment we are, we are currently conducting a, a multi-year a piece of research to better understand migration trends in the Pacific, um, which will, as discussed, build the capacity of our policy. So to the panelists from your communities, have you seen any standout or exemplary examples of data gathering that incorporate youth experiences and perspectives that we can learn lessons from and take inspiration from? Thank you again. Moderator, who do you want to answer this question? I might turn to Kalud, if you don't mind, because you're the one who first brought up the data question for us, and I suspect you have some suggestions or perhaps some examples to share. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, intervention and for the question. Um, I think we do have some uh, standing out examples, but I'm not sure how much they reflect the uh, challenges that youth face in terms of climate change and the human mobility. The direct nexus between both um, uh, topics is not uh, very available, I would say, and that's where, why I raised the issue of the existing gaps. But I think in terms of migration, there is a huge data available. I think um, even for uh, the um, whole region, uh, there is a variety of uh, data available. And I think uh, Tunisia is standing uh, out uh, from, from the other countries uh, because we do have a very interesting, um, I would say, route for outgoing and incoming uh, migrants. So I think that's why I believe we have a, a variety of data and it's very available. And I'm happy, of course, to share with you um, the, the available resources, but I definitely emphasize on more research perhaps or more specific research in terms of the real challenges that um, make youth tend to migrate and mm -hmm. how youth are um, confronted with the question of should I stay or go when a climate uh, change event occurs. So I think that's the real uh, challenge right now and why not 
allow young people to be the contributors of such research so that we go uh, from the different regional uh, dynamics and that can reflect actually the, the accurate challenges that young people face. Thank you very much, Kulun. Thank you. Moderator, if you permit me, even though we're slightly over, I might, I might go to uh, the Initiative of Change International just for one more comment or question. Absolutely, please do. Thank you so much um, to the panelists and to IOM for recognizing also the importance of youth voices. Um, I'm humbled to be here. I speak as a white European youth climate activist representing initiatives of change and creative leadership, a platform for young people to reconceptualize leadership and encourage transformation beginning with the self. So this informs and also limits um, my views. Regarding uh, the challenges of migration and the climate crisis for youth in my region, so Europe, I see governments shifting to the right. Um, I see the psychological impacts of losing one's home and moving, as has been mentioned. So solastalgia, the emotional or existential distress caused by environmental change. And I see also continued inequalities of the intersection between the climate crisis and migration. So environmental debt is still highest in the global north, and yet the global south suffers most. So we as young people, want to be part of a society of care that recognizes also the responsibilities that we hold. And many young people are mobilizing to imagine worlds otherwise and need support. Um, again, it's been said before, um, we need holistic approaches. So this is as much a crisis of how we treat each other as of how we treat nature. We need to be included in discussions on solutions to be able to co-create and to be taken seriously. And we need language which recognizes the urgency. So moving from climate change to climate crisis or social ecological crisis and from sustainability to regeneration. Um, and we also need a, a redistribution of power. So asking our, ourselves who's making the decisions on whose behalf. Um, so my, my questions to the panel are really, um, how are the youth engaging other youth? And where are you now looking for added support? Thank Moderator, you. who are you going to? Um, maybe let's take Eddie, if you don't mind, and uh, share a bit about how youth are engaging and could engage most effectively. You talked about engagement. Go ahead. Okay, so um, first we have the youth engagement within the political um, sphere, and then we have the youth engagement within the youth platforms. So first one, talking about the, the political scenarios. Um, there's a huge opportunity to keep engaging people, youth people through national consultations, creating youth advisory panels, having youth, um, for example, in the Dominican Republic, we have an example of the youth councils mm -hmm. for specific government institutions. So that helps that when a policy is being designed, youth perspectives are integrated and not limited to one seat at the table. We know what it means to be present at these conversations, and we really appreciate it. But if we do not keep that um, always, if we just do it to comply with the checkbox of, oh, yeah, there was a youth representative, it's it not going to mean nothing because it is not in the DNA mm -hmm. of the policy development. So I would say those are good examples that I have seen through Latin America and the Caribbean countries. But also one point that I would like to highlight is the one related to um, youth being involved within youth spaces. So sometimes there are huge limitations to have um, intersectionality mm. within the youth movements. So we have to make sure that once we're talking about youth, which youth are we talking? Are we talking about youth in cities? Are we talking about youth in rural areas? Are we talking about youth um, that is less or more vulnerable to the effects of climate change? So having in, taking into consideration those intersectionality are necessary because we are youth, but, but we are pretty diverse and that diversity needs to be taken into consideration in these spaces. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you so much. So as we draw this panel to a close, um, moderator, I wonder if, if in a few minutes, are you able to perhaps give us a sense of what you take from this room, not only from your outstanding panelists, but also the comments and contributions you've had in, in a minute or two? I'd be very happy to, because I think there was a great coherence between what you said and the comments and the questions that were raised in the room. And I have eight very quick takeaways, very quick. The first is the need for data 
that is clearly disaggregated by region and is context specific. And that data needs to include research, innovation, and access to information for individuals, for example, about access to legal pathways and what may be available. Secondly, you mentioned, all of you, the need for capacity building for various different actors, capacity building for policymakers to really understand what that data means and therefore the implications for decisions, but also capacity building for the next generation in terms of education and really being aware about the implications of, of climate change. Third was the importance of not just statements and political declarations, but action plans, and then the concrete resources to actually implement them. So mobilizing not just the will to act in a political declaration, but the means to act and actually give effect to those actions. You all stressed, and all of you, and thank you so much from everybody in the room as well, that we need to make sure not only that youth is at the table, but that youth has a voice and that youth are considered in the policies, that they, your needs, your rights, your perspectives are actually at the heart of action. It's not just enough to check the box, mm -hmm. the seat at the table. And then coming to the importance of that engagement, you need to be empowered at political, financial, technical levels to be able to contribute most effectively and ensure that that voice is meaningful. I heard a clear concern about rising xenophobia and discrimination, particularly against particular groups. That has to be part of all of our concern. And then the need for adequate legal channels to migrate safely, regularly, in an orderly way, and for the means to access them, like documentation. And my final point, and this came from all of you, is the need for inclusive collaboration, not just between states, but bringing in diverse voices, including uh, LGBTQI um, communities and a very inclusive definition of who needs to be at the table. Thank you so very much to Thank all you. of our panelists. I want to give a round, long round of applause, if you might, to our voices. So, as we know, we have our next and final panel coming up. Uh, however, as we get ready for a quick technical change, I want to offer you a five-minute phone break. <laughs> that means you can check your emails, your WhatsApps, your TikToks if you need to, but please don't leave the room. Please do not leave the room. <laughs> this break will only be for five minutes. Off you go. You can go on Instagram. <laughs> 